our planet Earth. A world of mystery and imagination, science and wonder that is constantly being gazed upon and unraveled by the finest minds humanity has to offer. Welcome to the UniV Podcast, the show that presents a free-flowing conversation with those beings at the very center of the world of academia and research from all around the globe with your host, Simon Holland. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of the UniV Podcast. Today we are talking to Dr. Paula Magni. Dr. Magni is a forensic entomologist based at Murdoch University. She was born and raised in Italy and received her PhD at the University of Turin with a key focus on the application of natural sciences to crime scene investigation. Dr. Magni has worked as an expert forensic witness in some keynote legal cases and spent a few years working as a key story advisor on the crime scene drama series RIS. We welcome Dr. Magni to the show. Hello. Forensic entomologist teaching at Murdoch University, but originally from Italy. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yes, I'm a forensic entomologist. I'm a forensic scientist. So I work with bugs on the crime scene uh, investigation. I come from Italy. I studied at the University of Turin. At some point, I moved to Australia at the University of WA, where I completed my PhD. And after that, after a small, pe- a short period of postdoc, I moved to Murdoch, and I'm, a, I'm the lecturer of forensic science here at Murdoch, and I teach forensic entomology, crime scene investigation, and crime scene investigation in aquatic environment. So, what does forensic entomology involve? Everything about bugs, so insects, and other arthropods like spiders and some other little animals at the crime scene. Insects are very important because they are basically the animals that provide the decomposition process. So they eat the bodies and because of that they destroy the body and the only way to get information from a body that is completely destroyed by them is to ask the insect to give information. Information such as the time since death, presence of drugs, uh, DNA, that can be the DNA of the corpse or the DNA of maybe the perpetrator of the murder, and some more information like movement of the body from a place to another, presence of injuries, and some more things. And so who do you usually work with when you're working? So you're a researcher yourself? Yes. Yeah. Um, my work is divided between research, teaching, and also bureaucratic stuff because I'm a university member. So um, when I do research, I work myself, but also to together with other um, groups of research in different universities. Um, my main collaborators are at the University of Turin in Italy, uh, where we do works in entomotoxicology, um, at the University of Boston, where we do different works in uh, the composition process and also the composition in aquatic environments. Uh, I work together with the University of WA, where there are some uh, entomologists over there, where we work together with um, hyperspectral imaging, for example. and um, I I also work with the University of Liverpool with forensic anthropologists over there and archaeologists. So we do what we call archaeoentomology, that is the study of insects that are found on corpses that are actually very, very old, like mummies in the Egyptians' um, mm-hmm. pyramids and things like that. Is there still enough information within those insects? Because I know age is very important and preservation is very important with insects. Obviously, the, the, we cannot give any information about time since that because it's too far away, but we can have information about the season of death, but what we look after is um, more information about toxicology because insects remains uh, can stay in the environment basically forever. So if the, you are what you eat, and if the insect ate a body and the body was poisoned or used drugs during its life, the insect will preserve this information. That is the only way to get information from the body. So yeah, we do that in archaeoentomology. And how'd you get into this? I mean, to a <laughs> regular, regular folk trying to eat their dinner, this is kind of gross, <laughs> but is it there is. something about this that grabbed you and you just thought, this needs to be well, life, life I was food. always interested in the study of nature. I didn't want to cure animals like a vet. I, I really wanted to do research of animals, but I didn't want to do science for science. I wanted to do something that was applicable in the real life. And for some reason, I met the forensic entomology it is the use of insects on crime scene investigation so I can use the nature I can stu- you can use the study of the insects the analysis of the research to give information during an investigation and this information can be crucial in some crime scenes 
if you are the only one who can say when the person died, you are the only person who can give or take off an alibi to someone. Now, you've got such a pure science about you. Is it frustrating when you're dealing with, you know, a policeman and they drag the body across the dirt and they chuck it in the van, you know, that kind of process? Is there, is there things you need preserved? Yeah, well, uh, I'm working in this field since 2003, basically, and luckily the situation has improved a lot because in 2002 there was even no CSI on TV. That means that many policemen didn't know what a forensic investigation was. Now they are more aware and also the police academies are more open to do courses at uni or do update of their policemen. So yeah, the beginning the beginning was hard and now it's better and better because people know more. And um, we also have, um, yeah, movies sometimes can, can help. And um, yeah, also public prosecutors and judges are pretty open to these kind of things. And this is the reason why we have a number of cold cases that are reopened now that we know more stuff. I had a case that uh, I worked uh, a couple of years ago. There was actually a homicide that happened nine years before. And we get that information that were not available nine years before. So you took the, is that DNA, using DNA from the bugs? In that case was DNA from the bugs yeah. because the bugs were not collected properly. So they were basically destroyed and dried. And there were only some bugs um, still attached to the clothes of the person that died. And the, the person was buried, but the clothes were stored in a proper storage room in the police station. So we could work on the insect they were left over in the in the clothes so what was the case can you give us some background for that case or is that kind of classified secret uh, information no it's actually a published case so if you guys want to read more about that look after my name and cold case you will find the paper <laughs> and um yeah the south of italy a girl was missing for for three or four days and after three four days she was found in a wood uh, she was um, basically um, her body was um, her hands were uh, wrapped in um, a, a tape and feet as well. The head was covered by a plastic bag, and she was in the process of the decomposition. The problem is that okay, she disappeared for three days when she died. Yeah. So um, the pathologist at that time didn't use the insect and. She could not use any information from the decomposition of the body because when the body deco is decomposed, the pathologist cannot give much information anymore. Uh, basically, the pathologist is able to give a post-mortem interval, so a time since death, for 24, 72 hours maximum. That is the time when the body basically cool down until the temperature of the environment. So you we are 36 degrees normally and we lose one degree every hour af after the death until we get to the temperature of the environment. But think about Perth, how many days we have 36 degree mm. and we cannot use this method. So in many situations, you cannot use that method. You can use some more method, but in that case, no one was used. So we had information about cause of, causes of death, um, maybe movement of the corpse and things like that. But the crucial information was the time since death. And at that time, no, no one could give that. After nine years, we work on the bugs and uh, we use the information of the meteor station because bugs uh, grow based on the temperature. They, they grow faster if it's hot. They grow um, slower if it's cold. So it's very important. They are heterothermic animals, what we say. So it's very important to uh, compare the species, the age of the insect, and the, and the temperature of the environment. So we gave like um, a short frame of time to, um, to investigate on. And what we give is not a time since that, like an, an hour and minute, as Jessica Fletcher in Mardis, she wrote. <laughs> this doesn't happen. <laughs> we give a range of time, a minimum, maximum. And so the investigators can work on that precise time. So less energy to, to spend and less money to spend and less time. And something happened after that. We gave that time and some, some people were interviewed by the police and some people decided to end their life after this interview. So the case is kind of still open, but oh. closed. So yeah. So they ended their life after they realized that the net was kind of closing in on them. Apparently they didn't want to say too much because some relatives were involved and things like that. 
Okay. So um, this is not written in the in the publication, but it is. So how do you feel when you hear something like that? Did, did your work, did you got involved? I try to don't get any information before, and I, don't, I try to don't get any information after. I try to be as objective as possible. Then you have TV situation like news, news and things that come to you, but you really, I personally try to get less involved as possible to don't be personally involved in cases. Okay, so your first point of, point of contact is you walk into the um, post-mortem room or whatever, what's that called? I can go directly on the crime scene if I'm called on the crime scene oh, okay. or I can go to the autopsy the, to the, at the mortuary. It depends if yeah. I'm called on the on the, on the the side or not. So from your point of view, the earlier the better, right? So you yes. Can yes, also the because I know what to do and sometimes the police don't know what to do. So yeah. the best is to get all the information from the beginning and maybe have a double information at the mortuary. Sometimes you can't, but... That you have pictures, you have videos that maybe the police talk, and then you can come back to the side. You can find some more remnants of the bugs and things. But you know, um, as an expert, I prefer to do stuff by myself. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not because I don't trust, but because I know that these uh, the police or the pathologists are not prepared for these kind of things. This is the reason why we made the app for the for the smartphone is to help them in case we cannot be there. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, tell us a little bit about this app because I did have a play with it. You said when we were teeing up the interview to download it. It's the first thing I did. Yeah. Um, were you involved in the development and what, what's it all about? So, um, the idea is that not many people like pathologists and, and police people that are normally on the crime scene know much about forensic entomology and how how much the insect can be used and useful uh, during an investigation. Or maybe they did like a, a short course, or maybe they studied a little bit, but they don't know much, and they don't carry any manuals, any guidelines on the crime scene. There is already so much stuff to carry at the crime scene. But everyone can have a smartphone. can be an iPhone, can be another kind of smartphone. So it's very easy for everyone to take the smartphone and open the app where there are information about what to do in the different crime scenes. So there is a sort of flowchart. Okay, you are at the crime scene. Where is the crime scene? On the in terrestrial environment, aquatic environments. How is the body? He's hanging. He's on the surface. He's fired. Is this? Is that? It, you click your situation and you have the information on what to do. You want to take the insect, what you can do with the insect. You can put the insect in a sort of standby situation. You can put the insect in, in a storage. Uh, you can store the insect for entomotoxicology. You can store the insect for DNA. So all the information are in your pocket. Basic is for free because the app is made for free. Yep. And uh, everyone can download it. And the, the app is actually present in, at this point, I think, in eight different languages from Chinese to Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, English, obviously, and um, German and um, Mandarin and something else I don't remember. And the idea is that not many policemen or pathologists maybe know English and they cannot think to translate what, when they are working on the crime scene. So it's better for them to have their own language on. And we, we didn't translate that by ourselves. Uh, apart from Italian, obviously, <laughs> but we asked the different experts in the different uh, countries to help us in terms of the translation of the app. So we had to acknowledge that we had many, many friends and entomologists that helped us out for this app. Um has been downloaded lots of time, like 10,000 times. And um, we also receive email from, from this app, from people that need help and need um, consultations and things like that. So it's pretty good because you have a little manual in your pocket. I've been having a lot of fun with it. So you can download it from, I got it from Google Play, Play on the Android, um, and it's called Smart Insects. And so I've gone straight into Crime Seas and Insect Collection, and then I've clicked Insect Preservation, and then Crime Scene. And then the flowchart goes to four scenarios, buried corpse, exposed corpse, corpse in water, corpse in mortuary. So I really hope I'm not actually having to use this app for real. <laughs> so either of those situations probably yeah. turn my stomach a little bit. Is there different types of insects that prefer different sorts of, does that help you, you know, so in the aquatic environment, there's different types of insects to in... Um, you have to consider that insects that live in water, want to stay in water. So as soon as you move the corpse from the water to outside, they will try to get back to their environment. So you have to be very careful when you get the body 
in order to immediately see if there are any insects or you have to put the body in a special bag to preserve these kind of bugs because they are not the typical bug that you can actually see as a maggots or the flies. They are maybe little because they are little larvae of midges or uh, uh, mosquitoes and things that people don't think they are insects. There is actually a very famous case that is called the red fiber there was this corpse that was found in a terrestrial environment covered by these little red fibers, very, very tiny red fibers. And no one could understand what the hell these red fibers were. So some people thought they were saffron uh, fibers, like the pieces of the flower. And then these pictures went to an entomologist and he said, these are not fibers. These are uh, chironomid larvae, so midges larvae. But the corpse was found in a terrestrial environment. So they immediately said, maybe the corpse was somewhere else before. And they realized that the, it, the corpse was somewhere else. And the fact that these kind of bugs live only in certain kind of water that had to be uh, sh shallow, they had to be very slow or no moving at all, they had to be kind of dirty waters and things, they realized that where the corpse was found was a secondary crime scene. So they moved to the primary crime scene. At that point, they found more information about that. Really? Yes. And there was a resolution for that? You had to read the case. Oh. <laughs> Leaving us hanging along. There is a lot of reading to do. Whereabouts do you usually publish when you publish? For NCSI International, the most. Uh, Journal of Medical Entomology, uh, Journal of um, Journal of Forensic Science, yeah, journals in, and I, I also publish uh, different chapters in different books about um, just forensic entomology or forensic science, and I have a few. Um, a small um, article that come from bigger article on Science Network Western Australia. Um, so basically science and forensics or just science and entomology. And how do you know what you want to publish on? Do you have like a whole list in say Google Keep or whatever that <laughs> Evernote, you know, of, this is what I want to do next or is it kind of you've had a practical application, you, you think it needs more investigation? Well, I try to do my research in, in a way that I know that at some point this research can be used somehow. Uh, so, for example, I have uh, every year I have at least one or two students in entomotoxicology. Entomotoxicology is uh, literally what you eat. So the insect eat meat. Find you will find it just meat or the components of the meat in the bag. But if you, if they eat meat plus whatever drug, you will find the drug. But how are you going to find this drug? What's the limit of the detection of the instrument? What's the limit of um, uh, quantification of uh, of the substance and also if the what what is the effect of the drug to the to the bug is going to kill the bug is going to make the bug bigger is going to make the bug smaller what's the survival it's more less what happens so this is very useful when you find a corpse that maybe use drug so we did mm, several of these uh, master thesis, master research with students, and we work on methamphetamine, we work on nicotine, that is a very strong poison. We are working at the moment on ketamine, that is the rape drug, and we work on endosulfan and kumatetraril, that are uh, poisons that are used in agriculture, but also to make poison baits against animals. So, And then uh, we had uh, several cases similar to this research, so we could apply the results to the real cases. And plus, uh, I also publish many case reports when I have interesting cases that must be shared with the forensic community so people can see what we did, what we did well and what we did bad. And maybe if they have similar cases, they can do what we did or they can do even better. I hope they did better. <laughs> They're going to do better. Like the case of... Um, the man that was found on the seashore uh, covered by barnacles. Barnacles are not bugs. They are sort of cousins of bugs. They are crustaceans, uh, basically, say crabs, but similar. Yeah. They look like seashells. No one worked on barnacles in this particular species to identify anything. We were the first ones to use barnacles to identify from how long the corpse was in water, in sea water, and from where this corpse used to come from. So from that moment, many people are working on barnacles. 
But it's very interesting because barnacles are everywhere in the every kind of sea. And you could definitely work that into the archaeological perspective as well because barnacles have been around for God knows how long. Yeah. And if you find, you know, Titanic survivors or anything like that, you could probably sort of piece things together. Yeah, I, I actually try to speak to people that work work on the Batavia uh, to see if there are any bones with barnacles and things like that. But apparently the corpse were all buried in um in terrestrial environment. So I, I, in this moment, no, but who knows in the future. So you're like, oh, damn, there wasn't enough. <laughs> but but the thing. point is that um, barnacles do not care if they are attached to a body or a piece of wood or another thing. So if we want to identify the time spent in water by a bottle or a piece of wood or a corpse, it's exactly the same thing. Unless we have to consider that barnacles are very fussy in terms of where they want to attach. They don't like very slimy surfaces. They like rough surfaces. So one of my research at the moment that I'm doing together between Murdoch and UWA, the Oceans Institute with Professor Patiaraki, is identify if there is a difference in the attachment time and survival and growth of the barnacles on different kinds of fabrics. It's different on lycra, it's different on uh, cotton, it's different on wool, it's different on shoes. They, they work with shoes, uh, comparing, um, let's say, uh, gym shoes and elegant shoes, so plastic shoes and leather shoes, is the work that I'm doing with a student in Boston. So that is very interesting because maybe we have different kind of answers and no one He's doing that at the moment, just us. Now, if anyone's listening out there, is there any cases that you would love to work on? Do you, do you think you could definitely help on if you could just get to the cold case box? Yeah, probably. There are a couple of famous serial killers in Italy that are still not solved, but I know that when the corpse of this serial killer were found, had bugs. So... Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so pitch them, be like, let me in there, let me get to that yeah, corpse and you yeah. can download some stuff. Are there bugs that eat other types of bugs on these corpses? So, you know, is, there a is it a competitive breeding ground for lots of different types of bugs when you when you find that? Is that does that throw a wrinkle in your work? Uh, every case is unique. You have kind of a sort of, uh, there is a work that is called the successional waves that says that after an amount of time, you have this way, the first way, the second way, the third way, that is the group of insects that are interested in the different stages of the decomposition. So you know that, for example, flies will be the first group and that kind of flies before another kind of flies. And then you have beetles, that kind of beetles, because some, some more beetles will arrive after them. So you have kind of seven waves of, of insects that should arrive from when the corpse is fresh to when the corpse is just bones. Well, this is the ideal, the utopic situation, and then you have completely different situations. Like, for example, um, when the corpse is found in a very dry place, like in a, in a desert, desert, the corpse get dried immediately. Flies will not give, will not lay any eggs on the, on the body. So you will have just um, bills that are eating the body. And this is the way the fly, the flies protect their, uh, their, their kids basically, because they know that if they lay eggs in that kind of environment, the kids will not have any possibility to eat because the corpse is too dry. Then you have situations in which you have animals that will eat the, bu the, the bugs. So the bugs are not there, not because they were not there, but because someone else Aid them. So you have a food chain that can change any time based on the kind of environment. Uh, the, the six, the seven, um, successional waves will change if the body is buried and depending on how, how, how deep is buried, you have a different situation. If you are in a city, it's different rather than a rural environment. Here in Australia, we have species that we don't have in Italy or we don't have in America. So every case has to be taken by itself. So you have basically an idea of what you normally should find, and then you have, you have to work from that, and you have to consider that. That is just maybe. I'm surprised that people haven't called you for a TV show, because you've got cold case, you've got CSI. Well, this is I, kind of the next I thing. actually worked for five years in Italy as, a, as the editor and the writer for uh, the Italian version of CSI. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. And um, after the first season that I just I was just working for them to give them some ideas, they decided that forensic entomology was too cool <laughs> and too too interesting, and they decided to 
add a character to the movie that was just a forensic entomologist. So I work with this actress that was um, a Japanese actress that in the movie was um, like a, a, a girl uh, that was born from a Japanese father and an Italian mother. And the funny part of this is that we work very, very close together because she had to learn what to do in a lab. She's an actress. She's, She's not. You. Yeah, yeah, she was being me. And they decided that to have a sort of relationship with the bugs, she had to spend some time with the bugs with herself, by herself. Oh. And when she was spending time in the lab talking with the bugs, she was talking with the bugs in Japanese. Oh, really? <laughs> and then they just did They're not going to understand it because they're yeah. Italian bugs. So when she was working with the people, normal people, <laughs> she was speaking in Italian with a Roman, a Roman accent because she, she, is, she is actually born in, in Rome. So she looks Japanese, absolutely Japanese. But yeah. She speaks very Italian dialect from Rome. Yeah. And um, but when she was speaking with bugs, she was speaking in Japanese. And I think it was very nice. And um, she had a number of, um, she, there was also some, there were also some scenes in their uh, room, in their house. And she used to um, grow uh, bugs as well as pets. And this is what I used to do. <laughs> like mantis, like orchid mantis that are beautiful mantis that looks like flowers. So... Um, and she's actually now having some of them at home because she found they were absolutely beautiful. So when you watch the show back now, do you look at it and you go, that is bang on, that's exactly the right insect because I was involved? As opposed to like other yes. Hollywood shows, you look at that, that's not how they do it at all. Um, yeah, I mean, they tried to follow everything I said. And they could not follow everything because sometimes it was just difficult to, to to do what I asked, but that's fine. It's only me knows that, only myself knows that. <laughs> this was not what supposed to be and um, but yeah everything was controlled and when i was watching the movies i was actually watching the movie with um with the plot of the movie with a uh, you know the the cartoon saying that the other cartoon saying that and i was actually oh with the script, and yeah, you're following with the script along. that was very <laughs> funny so yeah and i tried to don't say any any to anyone how the story ended so, <laughs> but some of the stories that were talk in the in the movie were actually my cases real cases just a little bit modified to you know to become a movie and things so i should be proud <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're gonna have to. We're gonna have to get some subtitles, and if we want to watch those, yeah. So it's Italian, Italian CSI. Yeah, it's called uh, RIS. It is Reparto di Investigazioni Scientifiche. So our CSI is called RIS. It is um is our acronym for uh, say CSI. Is um is the group of the scientific group of the Carabinieri. That is the military police. In Italy, there are two different groups of police. The military police is the Carabinieri, Arma dei Carabinieri. And the non military police is the polizia. Uh, they work in different areas in different ways and both have scientific groups, but this police is the most important group. So I was in the most important group. <laughs> and you said you used to grow um, creatures in your room. When was that? Was that as a kid or because, you know, everybody got the little like upside down thing with the one bit of food yeah. and then how did it go from there? It just got a little out of control. You must have been a tough housemate. Yeah. Well, I was the only child and that was pretty good for my mom because she had only one crazy kid at home. <laughs> and yeah, I never enjoyed to have mammals around me. They gave me a hamster and they gave it away after a week. But I was more into bugs and reptiles and amphibians and things like that. So yes, I'm weird. Yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was very interesting for... um yeah, it was basically everyone knew from when I was extremely young that my future was going to be with animals somehow. Yeah. Probably no one hoped for me to work in the grossest area <laughs> ever, but yeah, it's good. If you were walking along, say, just outside on a pathway and you saw a particularly interesting bug, would you grab it and put it in your pocket? Uh, no, really. No, okay. No. So you grab it on that phase now. <laughs> I, I like to take pictures, yes, uh, but no, not grab. My husband would be not that happy. It's not... <laughs> This is not understanding as my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen um, David Attenborough's Life of Insects, the documentary series? Um, I did. I yeah. did. What did you think of that? Was that because some of the photography in that is just unbelievable? Yeah, I mean, bugs are absolutely amazing. If everything will die in the world, they will survive because they have the possibility to 
grow in different environments. They can find their food. Some of them don't even have to eat. Um, their kids eat completely different things in completely different environments. So they are made for survival. And, um, uh, Colors are unbelievable. Structure are unbelievable. Sometimes I have the possibility to work with scanning a lexical microscope and people have to kick me off because I, I will stay there all day long. You open these little eggs that you can just see as a little white spot and then you enlarge that and there is a structure that can be something from a fairy tale. It's unbelievable. But I'm in love with my, um, with my science, so I'm very biased. What do you do with cockroaches at home for the, as sort of the last question? What's the solution? <laughs> what do you do first of all? Uh, yeah, cockroaches are big, big, big here in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a little pot, uh, like a small pot in, in, in my garden where there are frogs. So I normally catch the cockroach and I put them close to the pot. Um, so I hope that nature does the rest, like jungle grow. And so <laughs> does your dirty work. I don't I, exactly. I don't wanna. I don't wanna be the one that kill the cockroach. I, I hope someone else will kill the cockroach for food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I say like push the food chain. That's probably a good solution because I haven't figured out a good way to kill a cockroach yet. They yeah. seem to survive telephone books and feet and yeah, getting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, um, having so many amphibians at home, they, you know, how to grow toads and frogs. So, yeah, you can have them as a pet and you can just provide them. <laughs> now, is it true that they'll survive a nuclear war? Is that's a big myth that I've heard a lot? Um, it, a cockroach would be survive a nuclear bomb or something like that. Uh, I would not be willing to try, but they are strong enough. Yeah. Yeah, strong enough. Yeah. Okay, good. That put to rest that because I've always wondered that. I'm like, this does not sound correct. This information. <laughs> good to see. Okay, well, thank you very much for appearing on the show. We've had a lot of fun, you. and um, hopefully, we see you on an Australian TV show next because that sounds really interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you for listening to the UniV podcast. To follow our series, please subscribe to our channel via iTunes, Beyond Pod, or the equivalent service. And if you particularly enjoyed the show, please don't forget to rate. For further information, news, videos, and articles, head to univ.com.au. 